Hello there, AP Environmental Science class. Welcome to part one of my lecture on chapter 15, energy efficiency and renewable energy. Uh, 60, I think it's 68 slides uh, in this lecture. So I will break them into two parts here, this lecture. So again, part one uh, now and make sure to watch a part two at some time later. So here we go. Part one, energy efficiency and renewable energy. We start off as we normally do with a core case study talking about saving energy, saving money and reducing our environmental impact. So to me, this sounds like a win, win, win situation, right? 43% of money Americans spend on energy is unnecessarily wasted. Think about that for a second. Think about the amount of money you spend in your home on energy. Let's just use a round dollar figure. Let's say $100 a day you spend on energy in your home. Well, that's really not the case. You're really spending $57 a day on energy and you're taking $43 and ripping it up and throwing it in the garbage every day. Think about that. All right. That makes no sense. So what are some of the main sources of wasted energy? Well, gasoline in our cars are very inefficient. Uh, while the gasoline does propel the car, uh, it also produces a lot of heat, right? Ever touch the top of, of a car uh, that has been running? It's very hot. That heat is wasted energy. Um, and so again, gasoline, cars, not very efficient. Air leaks cause heat loss from buildings. I think about the classrooms here uh, at Ardsley High School, right? Uh, a lot of leakage going on here, uh, and that causes the heat to have to stay on nonstop, which again, uh, waste energy. Some easy and cost-effective solutions, right? Caulking home windows and doors. What is caulking? Putting that white kind of uh, gluey substance to help with the leaks and adding insulation to your home as well uh, can prevent leaks and can actually save, save you lots of money by saving lots of energy. So again, some of the things we're going to think about, first part of this lecture of this chapter is talking about energy efficiency. The second part gets into more of, of, of the renewable energy sources. So why do we need a new energy transition? Well, because again, we've been talking about it. We need to move away from fossil fuels to more energy efficiency and renewable energy, right? And the world really currently only in the early stages of this transition. We need this new transition, this new energy transition to improve energy efficiency and reduce energy waste. We need to decrease dependence on our non-renewable fossil fuels. And we need to rely more on a mix of renewable energy sources, which we'll talk about more later on in this lecture. Benefits. Saves money. Sounds great. Create jobs. Even better. Reduces air, air pollution. Yes. Keeps climate change from accelerating. So obviously a lot of win-wins here. Uh, we need the shift due to increasing availability of cheaper solar and wind and advances in renewable technology. Renewable technology, guys, right now is kind of at the base. Uh, the foundation is, has just been built over the past 20 to 30 years. So I point that out because you guys getting into the workforce in a couple of years, uh, if you are going to be in environmental science, renewable energy, uh, you could get in on the ground floor um, and potentially make a lot of money. So keep that in the back of your mind. Another case study, Germany, a renewable energy superpower. Uh, they have goals by 2050. They want to obtain 60% of their energy from renewable resources. They want to increase electricity efficiency by half, 50%. They want to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by up to 95%. And they want to sharply reduce the use of coal, right? We spoke about coal in the previous chapter, has a high energy yield, net energy yield, but is so terrible for the environment, just so, so dirty. Uh, they've actually done something over there called a feed-in tariff, meaning utilities by law by law, must buy electricity from homeowners with solar cells and feed that uh, electricity into the electrical grid. So here in the United States, we do have some programs like that, but utility companies aren't required to buy extra electricity from homeowners that have solar cells on their home. In Germany, they are required to do that. And of course, that reduces uh, the cost of your energy. So why is improving energy efficiency and reducing energy waste an important energy resource? 
because we could just save the resources that we are currently using, right? Improvements in energy efficiency and reductions in energy waste could save one third or 33% of the energy used in the world. And here in the U.S., could be up to 43%, as again, the previous slide told us that 43% of the energy is wasted here in the U.S. So if we can improve our energy efficiency, right, instead of you ripping up that $43 and throwing it out, right, maybe you only have to rip up $15 and throw it out and 75 or 85 of that $100 you spend on energy a day actually goes towards energy, right? How much better would our energy efficiency be and how much uh, how much less resources would we need if we just saved energy, right? Many technologies exist for increasing energy efficiency of industry, vehicles, appliances, and buildings. Uh, and again, if you can come up with even better ways to increase energy efficiency, that could make you a rather rich person. What is energy efficiency? How much useful work we get from each unit of energy. Energy conservation is the reduction or elimination of unnecessary energy waste. And that's what we are talking about in here. Some more sources of energy waste. We talked about poorly insulated buildings. We talked about reliance on cars, which again, gasoline and cars isn't really very, isn't that efficient. Uh, huge data centers we have around the world filled with electronic servers. They use only 10% of the energy they consume, though they consume all this energy, but they actually only use 10%. 90 of it is wasted, usually in the form of heat. You ever go into those electrical server rooms, uh, they are air conditioned really hard because of the heat. So there you go. Not only is it releasing heat, but now they need more energy to keep the uh, uh, keep the servers cool. So again, a lose-lose situation there. Motor vehicles with internal combustion engines like cars, again, uh, nuclear, coal, and natural gas power plants also waste uh, a lot of energy as well. We spoke about that uh, in the previous chapter. So what we're looking at here is the flow of commercial energy uh, in the U.S. economy. Only 16% of the country's high quality and energy ends up performing useful tasks. The rest of it is wasted, right? So here we go. 82% of our energy inputs right now are coming from non-renewable fossil fuels. You got 8% from non-renewable nuclear and about 10% from the renewable fuels. Fuels They go into the U.S. economy. What comes out? 9% useful energy. That's it. 7% are some byproducts, some petrochemicals. 41% is that unavoidable energy loss. Again, 41 to 41% uh, uh, it's unavoidable, but 43% is waste that is avoidable, right? So this 41 is tough. You know, when you're converting energy, there is going to be some heat. There is going to be some, some, well, some waste energy that is not usable. But it's this number that is ridiculous. This 43% of energy wasted. If we could reduce this number increase the useful energy output, then you can decrease the inputs to get the same output. That's what we're trying to do here. That is what energy efficiency is all about. So one of our favorite charts here, again, solutions for improving energy efficiency. Uh, this, this prolongs our fossil fuel supply. So even though we should be transitioning off of fossil fuels to renewable energy, if we at least stop wasting energy, we need less fossil fuels, right? Uh, right off the bat there. So that would help us immediately. Uh, it reduces oil imports and improves energy security. Again, countries that tend to not like us tend to have uh, right now at least the most, uh, the most oil, the most, uh, um, you know, uh, non-renewable resources that, that we need to get. Um, improving energy effici efficiency increases that net energy yield, right? It makes it higher because it costs less to produce and actually create the energy. There's your go, low cost, right? Reduces pollution and environmental degradation. It buys time to phase in the renewable energy and it creates local jobs. So again, lots of positives come out from improving our energy efficiency. All right, how do we do it in industries and utilities? That was kind of talking about our homes. Well, something called cogeneration is uh, the new kind of buzzword. Basically what it does is, is com it combines heat and power together. So you have two forms of energy that come from the same fuel source. So instead of having uh, an industry that just creates heat or just creates power, have them do both from the same energy source that's called co, right, to 
cogeneration. Replace energy wasting electric motors, recycle materials, use energy efficient LED lighting, uh, meter your energy use so you can actually see what you're, what you're using and shut down unused computers and lights, kind of some basic things that you can do. Um, right now, the current electrical grid system is outdated and it's wasteful. So it, a lot of this has to do with the infrastructure that we have here in the country that really you and I on a regular basis can't really help. Um, we need more money from the federal government to come in here and to update our, our, our system, right? Um, we need an interactive grid is what we need, which has ultra, ultra high voltage, super efficient transmission lines that don't lose energy to heat and things like that, that don't waste it, that just keeps the energy in the lines, digitally controlled so we know what's going on, responds to local changes in demand and supply, right? Doesn't just give you, you know, right? In, uh, in the summer, you need a lot of energy to cool. When the temperature is 65 degrees outside, you really don't need a lot of energy. So have a place that you can respond, send energy to one location, reduce energy in another location, depending on what's going on. Easier to buy renewable energy. And the uh, if we do this, we could save over $2 trillion over the next 20 years if we build an interactive and more energy efficient electrical grid. Again, updating the infrastructure here in the United States. We also need to make transportation more efficient, right? We have to, that full cost pricing we always speak about, right? The hidden cost of gasoline, cafe, the corporate average fuel economy, right? Needs to be increased. Government subsidies and tax breaks for oil companies need to not, we need to cease giving them tax breaks. If we do that, all the hidden costs, the gas would be $12 a gallon here in the United States, right? So we've talk, spoken about this full cost pricing. I know I've mentioned this before to many of you. Uh, but again, if we add in all the hidden costs, the environmental costs of, of gasoline, gas would be $12 a gallon here in this country. And I guarantee you, we would be moving uh, to more electric and more hybrid vehicles, most all of us, right? If you were paying $12 a gallon for gas. So think about that. We need to build or expand mass transit and high speed rail right? This was when we, a couple of chapters ago, when we talked, spoke about sustainable cities. Well, not only does it help sustain your city, but it also helps making a uh, more energy efficient uh, uh, transportation. We need to carry more freight by rail instead of trucks because rail um, produces and uses less fossil fuels than trucks. And again, like we, with, with those sustainable cities, we need to encourage biking by building bike lanes. All right. How can we switch to energy efficient vehicles? We're beginning to see that, right? There are a lot of Teslas uh, driving around these days, which are fully electric vehicles. So we have a couple of different types. There are gasoline electric hybrid cars. There are plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. There are electric vehicles with a hydrogen fuel cell. And there are car bodies made of light composite materials that don't need a lot of energy to propel the car, right? A lot of our cars now are very heavy. Um, and so it takes a lot of energy to move them. If we can make the uh, cars much lighter, then obviously you'll lose, uh, need less energy, right? So what we're looking at here is on the left is a conventional hybrid car. Um, this is called the gas electric hybrid car. It's basically powered by a small internal combustion engine with an assist from a strong battery. Uh, what's nice about the conventional hybrids is that you don't need to ever plug in the battery. The conventional hybrid, the engine, the combustion engine as it runs actually recharges the battery. When you need power, when you want to go fast, you use the combustion engine. And then when you're in like the streets around your town and you're going under 30 miles per hour, the battery kicks in and you're just using the battery. So, um, very nice. A lot of them out there uh, in the market now. Uh, and again, you don't have to plug it in. There's the plug-in hybrid, which is similar. You still have an internal combustion engine, so you're still burning some fossil fuels. But there's a couple of batteries in this car that are more powerful, so the batteries can actually uh, extend for longer use. However, in the plug-in hybrid, you have to plug in the car uh, to an electrical charger to charge up the batteries. Um, and in the past that was difficult, but now you're beginning to see much more of these electrical plug-in outlets out there. What, what is not shown is what a Tesla is, which is a pure electrical car. Um, these cars, no internal combustion engine. You don't ever use fossil fuel. You plug the car in, it charges up the battery and the battery runs the car, be it on side roads or be it on the highway. Again, they're out there now. The prices are beginning to come down. 
Um, 10 years ago, only the ultra rich were able to have these hybrids and these electric cars. Now, again, you see a lot of teachers, right, with, with, with Teslas and with hybrids. So if you know teachers are buying them, uh, you know that they're not super expensive. So again, definitely can help uh, switching to these energy efficient vehicles. Uh, again, definitely can help uh, use less of those fossil fuels, or use less uh, of, of that gasoline. All right, buildings. We need to design buildings that save energy and money. So we need to talk about green architecture. We need to talk about living or green roofs, which are specially formulated soil and vegetation that actually sit sits on the roofs of apartment buildings. Not only is it nice uh, to go up there and have a park, but believe it or not, it keeps the buildings cooler in the summertime so you don't need to run the air conditioning all the time. Super insulation, right? No need for a heating system if the house is super uh, insulated. Um, U.S. Green Building Council's leadership in energy and environmental design lead are beginning to set up some standards for this as we go through the 21st century. Again, if you're into architecture and you're into environmental science, this may be the place for you to build, uh, to start looking at green architecture, start a, start a green architecture firm, and I have a, uh, have a feeling you'll make a lot of money down the road, right? What are we looking at here? One of these green roofs. This is Chicago's City Hall. And again, not only is it nice to go up there and hang out during your lunch break, uh, but it actually keeps the uh, building cooler during the summer months. All right. So how can we save energy and money in existing buildings, right? So obviously we want to build more green buildings as we go through the next uh, century, but we have a lot of buildings out there right now. They're not going to be torn down. So what can we do to them uh, to help save energy and money? Well, get a home energy audit, right? Take a look, see exactly how much energy you are spending. Insulate your building, plug those leaks so that you're not letting air conditioning or heat uh, escape out into the world. Use energy efficient windows, stop other heating and cooling losses, heat interior spaces more efficiently, heat water more efficiently, and use energy efficient appliances, computers, and lighting in your building. So, Another great chart, again, you don't need to memorize the entire chart, but I can see an FRQ saying, hey, what can you do? Give me three examples of what you can do to save energy in your home. So here's a bunch of examples. I would definitely pick out a few, right? In the attic, hang reflective foil near the roof to reflect heat. Use a fan. Bathrooms, right? Uh, install water-saving toilets and faucets. Kitchen, maybe clean the refrigerator coils and run only full loads of the dishwasher. Basement or utility room, again, front-loading clothes washers. We spoke about that uh, previously. Set your water heater to 140, 120 or lower if no dishwasher is used. You'll notice in other rooms, LED light bulbs, turn off lights, set thermostats low, etc. Outside, plant deciduous trees. Right? What are deciduous trees? Those are trees with leaves that block the sun in the summer, but let the sun in in the winter because the leaves fall off. I mean, that's perfect, right? The shade in the in the in the summer keeps you cool, and then lets the sun in in the winter to keep you warm. We love our deciduous trees, so plant a lot of them um, outside your home. So again, just some ways um, for buildings that are already there how you can save energy and money. So why are we wasting so much energy and money, right? It seems counterintuitive to everything we do, right? We always want to save money. We always want to save energy. Well, energy remains artificially cheap. We're not doing the full cost pricing, right? Gas is not $12 a gallon like it should be if we uh, put in the cost uh, of the environmental degradation. We have government subsidies, tax breaks, right, to energy companies. The prices don't include the true cost. Few large and long-lasting incentives for improving energy efficiently, efficiency and reducing waste. We don't have them. We need to get more of these incentives and uh, need something, uh, the rebound effect as well. Another problem when it comes to wasting money and energy. So reasons renewable energy is not more prevalent. You would think, hey, this is the way to solve our problem. Well, there's an inaccurate perception that solar and wind energy are unreliable and intermittent. That is not that is not the case, right? Also hear stories about how we're killing birds because they're flying into, into windmills. Not happening. Government subsidies and tax breaks lower for renewable energy than for fossil fuels, right? Uh, that we need to do that, okay? Prices for non-renewable energy do not include the harmful environmental impacts, right? That's the full cost pricing. 
And we need to know that this shift is going to take decades. It's not going to happen tomorrow, right? So when you hear politicians say we need to do this tomorrow, it's not happening. We need to have a 50 to 100 year plan to wean us off the fossil fuels and get us on to uh, the renewable energy. Again, it's going to take time, um, but it needs to be done. And honestly, if you look around, it is being done. It's slow. But again, we're seeing more hybrid, more electric cars, you know, over the last five, 10 years than I've ever seen in my life. So I know that uh, things are moving in the right direction. We just have to move in that direction a, a, a little quicker, even though we need to also understand that it is going to take some time. All right. So that was the part of the chapter that spoke about energy efficiency and energy waste. Now we're going to dive into the forms of renewable energy out there that can be used. So the first is our friend, the sun. What are the advantages and disadvantages of using solar energy? Well, passive and active solar heating systems can heat water and buildings very effectively. The cost of using sunlight to produce electricity is falling rapidly as, again, the technology of solar cells, solar panels like that get better and better. They get cheaper and cheaper, and then more regular folks can buy them. So heating buildings and water with solar energy, we have a passive and an active. Uh, passive solar heating system absorbs and stores heat from the sun directly within a well-insulated structure. Active solar heating captures energy from the sun in a heat absorbing fluid. All right, so let's talk about the differences because you are going to need to understand them. On the left is a passive solar house. It is just what it sounds like, passive. There is nothing happening. All you do is have a house that has windows, that has insulation, and that has a way to allow hot air to escape in the summer. All that happens here is the sun comes through the window heats the house, and the insulation keeps the heat in the house. That's it. If it gets really, really hot, some of the heat will vent out to escape in the summer, but in the winter, you close this vent so the heat stays trapped in. You'll notice how this, uh, the windows are in the summer where when the sun is higher in the sky, a lot of that sunlight isn't getting through the window. So again, keeping the house relatively cool. But in the winter, where you, when you have a lower sun angle, all of that sunlight getting through the window heating the house. You have a stone floor and a stone wall to keep the heat stored in. And that's it. You don't have electricity. You don't have uh, um, um, oil or gas heating your home. This is it, right? So in the summer, the sun heats it. Not as much because it's not much sunlight getting through the windows. We let the vent, that let the hot air out. In the winter, the sun is going through, heating the stones, keeping the house nice and warm. In an active, okay, solar home, there's some action going on. And what is that action? That action is water. So what happens here is you have a solar collector on the roof. You have a pump with water that goes up through the solar collector. The heat from the sun heats up the water in this solar collector that then goes down into a hot water tank and then through uh, heating systems then have that hot water flowing through the house, heating your home. Okay, obviously in the summer you wouldn't have that uh, uh, you wouldn't have that working. Okay, uh, and therefore in the summer the house would stay cooler. So active involves water usually going through a pump up through a solar collector, getting warm. The water gets warm up here and then goes through the house, exchanges the heat, and that warm water through a radiator uh, will keep the house uh, warm. Again in the winter. You shut this system, excuse me, in the summer, you shut this system off and the house just stays warm normally uh, from the sunlight getting in. Those are your differences between your passive and active solar homes. If you do have additional questions, uh, please reach out to me and I will explain them uh, in more detail for you. So again, trade-offs, passive or active solar heating. Again, I can see an FRQ, right? What are the advantages? Medium net energy. Very low emissions of carbon dioxide and other air pollutants, very low land disturbance, and a moderate cost for the passive. Disadvantages, you need access to the sun 60% of the time during daylight. So if you don't have that, it's going to be hard to uh, run a solar home. The sun can be blocked by trees and other structures, which could be a problem. High installation and maintenance costs for the active system. So the passive system is cheap, or at least moderate. Um, if you want this uh, active system with the heat pumps, it is going to cost initial, the initial capital is going to be high. 
And unfortunately, you do need backup systems for cloudy days, right? If it's cloudy for a week, uh, like uh, sometimes happens, um, obviously, uh, you're going to need a backup system. So those are the pros and cons of these uh, passive or active solar heating. Again, understand them. And if you have any questions, please come see me. All right. Cooling buildings naturally. How are what are methods to keep buildings cool? Open windows, right? When it's cooler outside, use fans, use super insulation and high efficiency windows, shade trees, overhangs, or window awnings to prevent the sun from shining through the windows. Use a light colored roof, right? That will reflect the sunlight instead of absorbing it. And geothermal heat pumps can actually bring cool air in from underground. We'll talk about that um, in part two of this lecture. Uh, geothermal could also be uh, the wave of the future. Right now it's very expensive, but again, we'll talk more about geothermal uh, coming up in part two. So <coughs> there's also ways that we can concentrate sunlight to produce high temperature heat and electricity. This is by using solar panels, right? So uh, you have a, thermal, a solar thermal system, which I showed you on the active house. This collects sunlight to boil water and produce steam to generate electricity used in deserts and open areas with ample sunlight. Uh, requires large volumes of cooling water, however, for condensing steam and cleaning mirrors. This would be like in a more of an industrial type solar thermal system, not necessarily uh, the little one that you would have uh, in an active solar home. Um, unfortunately, right now, the energy net energy yields are low, but that's because of the price to initially start uh, uh, this up. So what you're looking at here are um, solar thermal power. Uh, this is in the Mo Mojave Desert in California. California. Uh, these curved collectors uh, basically catch solar energy, uh, sends that solar energy into a plant somewhere where the energy heats water that produces steam that then turns a turbine that then produces electricity. Same thing here with these pictures. Uh, this is again in California. Um, this is another uh, system. These actually, these solar panels actually track the sun. So as the sun moves in the sky, the panels follow the sun. So you're getting direct sunlight all day long. Again, sun power goes into these panels, goes into a central uh, hub like this, where the panels uh, create heat, that heat water, that produces steam when the water boils, that turns a turbine, that then produces electricity. That's how it is go. So that's how it is done. So again, um, this is happening. It's very expensive right now to set up a lot of these solar arrays to actually have a catch enough sunlight to actually uh, produce enough electricity for people. But in places like California, where there is a lot of sunshine, it is getting cheaper and cheaper and more efficient. Uh, again, low net energy yield right now because of the cost uh, to set it up. But once it's set up and the cost is done, then it's actually rather cheap to run. So things to think about. All right. Again. Trade-offs from these solar thermal systems, advantages, high potential for growth. This is where you come in. No direct emissions of carbon dioxide or other air pollutants. Lower cost with natural gas turbine backup, right, to help you. It's a little bit of lower cost. And it's a source for new jobs. Disadvantages. Low net energy because of the high initial cost. So again, the idea is let's reduce these costs with technology and then the energy yield will increase. You need a backup or, cloud or storage system on cloudy days. It does require high water use. Again, you are boiling water to produce steam to run a turbine. So you do have, uh, you will need water resources. And they can disrupt desert ecosystems because obviously most of the time you're putting these in deserts because that's where you have a lot of sunshine. Well, you can only imagine uh, how the animals and the uh, plants they don't necessarily like that. So you can disrupt desert ecosystems, but honestly, not as bad as mining, guys. I mean, you saw the pictures of, the, of mining. Look at these pictures. Uh, definitely not as much of a, of a disruption uh, as mining could produce. Another great way, and I'm going to stop here uh, with solar energy, and we'll move on to the other forms of renewable energy in part two of my lecture. But these are great. Solar cookers can actually replace wood and charcoal fires. Uh, on the left is a solar cooker. On the left... On the right is a simple solar oven. These are both from Costa Rica. When I actually took training for this class uh, a bunch of years ago, one of the things we did was uh, the guy, the instructor, had this solar cooker. It looked like this. And we put chick a chicken and all these potatoes in this solar cooker. We put it outside in the morning. And by 3 p.m., we were eating the most delicious chicken and potatoes I had ever eaten in my life, solely cooked by the power of the sun. That's it. 
right? So especially in our developing countries where you have a lot of sunshine, instead of having them use wood and charcoal, which not only produces air pollution, but you have to, you know, cut down trees and things like that. There you go. The power of the sun to cook a delicious meal. That concludes part one of my lecture on chapter 15, energy efficiency and renewable energy. Make sure to tune in for part two. And as always, I thank you for listening.